Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general discussion series. And it is a question and answer session from people in San Diego. Presented by Jesus on the 2nd of November 2013 in San Diego, California, USA. This is session one, part two. Okay, should we get back to, let's start with Denny, because he had a question. It's an important question that I was waiting for somebody to ask, actually. <laughs> in, the, in the list that you had of those attributes... Uh, so let's list them again, shall we? Yes. So faith, will, humility, truth, love. Yep. Do you consider prayer to be an attribute of will and desire? Certainly. In fact, prayer is desire. So it's not included up there because it seems so significant to the list. It is very significant to your relationship with God, of course, prayer. But prayer is the full desire expressed within you, in your heart, from an emotional position towards God to receive love. So it actually is very much connected with how you use your will. It's one of the things you can do to use your will. I feel it's the most important thing you could do to use your will. The most important way to use your will is to learn how to pray. But just because a person is using their will in another direction, it doesn't mean that they're using their will to, prayer, to pray. But also... It, Prayer is not something that God forces upon you. God doesn't force it upon you. It's dependent upon how you exercise your will as to whether you will personally engage prayer. Right? So while prayer is essential for your relationship with God, right, it is actually an aspect of how you use your will. And in fact, prayer, in my opinion, is the the most important thing you could actually choose to do in the way in which you use your will. But it's still an aspect of how you use your will. Now, if you look at what prayer does, so if we look at it from a sort of diagrammatic point of perspective, here we have God's soul with masculine and feminine qualities. Here we have our half of the soul. So let's just draw it. If I'm male or something, let's just draw it like my half of the soul connected to my bodies, my spirit body and my physical body. It's my soul that was given the gift of will. So it's not my intellect. Right? It's not my mind, as people will tell you. It's your soul that's given the gift of will. It's how your soul uses its will as to whether it's praying or not. And the way it needs to exercise its will to pray is to have a longing, a sincere and pure, so let's define it more fully, a sincere, pure longing to receive love from God. All right? And when your soul is using its will in that regard, in other words, when you're having a passionate desire within yourself as a feeling, in that regard, you're praying. Right in that moment. But as soon as it's not a passionate desire anymore and it's just words coming out of your head, you're not praying anymore. And as soon as you connect to the passionate desire again, you're praying again. And as soon as you disconnect from that passionate desire and you're just thinking things, you're not praying anymore. Does that make sense? And it can be as instant as that, switching in and out of prayer. So a lot of people who say they're praying from an intellectual perspective, they're maybe stating a rosary or they may be having some kind of uh, our Father who, art is in, who, art, who, <laughs> who is in heaven um, uh, prayer to God, but it's not coming from the heart. That's not a prayer. From God's perspective, that's not a prayer. A prayer is something that engages God's soul from your soul. And that has to be feelings, longings that have developed within your soul that are pure in nature, not driven by addictions even. So 
Even a prayer that goes something like, I want you to come and fix up my life. Well, God's not going to answer prayers like that. And, and, and while that might be coming from your soul, there are certain prayers that God won't answer because to, to do that would have to take away some of God's laws and God's not ever going to do that. So if you want God to fix up your life, right, then that's not a very sincere prayer. And the reason why it's not sincere is because you're responsible for what you created in your life. So wanting God to fix it up is not very responsible and God won't respond to those kind of prayers. God will help you work through the issues as to why you created those things in your life if you sincerely have a longing to know. So that's what prayer is. And, and so therefore you could say prayer is the greatest expression of mankind's will. Does that make sense? So the greatest expression of your will is desiring to actually pray or to define it, to have a sincere and pure longing to receive love from God, to allow the transformation of your soul by the receiving of love from God. That is the thing that will cause your transformation. And we've been talking about addictions and fear and other things uh, earlier in the day, but those particular things are the things that prevent your transformation. This is the thing that engages your transformation. So prayer is the thing that engages your transformation of the soul, and the things that prevent your transformation of the soul are fear, addictions, using your will out of harmony with love, rejecting truth, rejecting faith, rejecting humility... They are the things that prevent you from changing. But the thing that actually changes you is God's love entering your soul. And in fact, I feel the majority of us need to learn to just give up trying to change ourselves and just focus on changing these things so that we can receive God's love into our soul. And if we focused on that, we'd have a very much more productive change in our lives as a result. Does that answer, Denny? Go on. Then uh, does intention precede the will to pray? I mean, where does intention fit in that topography? Yeah, good question. Uh, people have asked that during the break. Will engages so many things. So if you look at all of the things that are engaged in will, there are literally quite a number of qualities that are a part of will. Desire is one of the qualities that are a part of will. Intention is another Intention is really future desire. Does that make sense? You don't necessarily have it now, but you want to have it. It's an intention, and that's a part of will. Does that make sense? So will encompasses or, or um, involves so many things. Your desire for prayer is all about the exercise of your will. Your intention to change is all about the exercise of your will. So these qualities, desire, intention and so forth, are all a part of this beautiful gift that God gave you, which is the gift of how you're going to express yourself, how you're going to desire change and so forth. So it depends. You know, Some people desire to be harmful, but that's still a part of their will. Some people have the intention to be harmful even though they can't quite do it. That's part of their will. And in fact, any desire or intention that is out of harmony with love has consequences associated with it, in fact. So you can just intend to do something without doing it that's out of harmony with love and that has a negative consequence on your soul. Right? You can just intend to do it without actually carrying the deed out and it will have a negative consequence on your soul. And God's created it this way so that we have feedback systems that show us through these laws that God's created what creates our own unhappiness, what creates the unhappiness of others and, and what the underlying causes are, are all about how we exercise our will either in or out of harmony with love. So desire, intention, is there any other things you could think of that are a part of will uh, in terms of ideas or concepts? that are really a part of will? Volition. Sorry? Volition. Like will in action. Um, sorry, I didn't get the word. Volition. 
B O L I T I O N. Volition? What? Like will, will in action. Is that what volition means? Yeah. Because it's not my understanding of the word. Well, how do you understand it? It's the opposite of will in action, is my, what I understood. Can I just rub that out for a bit? Because I'm not sure. sure about the meaning of that word. <laughs> yeah. Passion? Very good. Longing? Can I add to that? Can we? Creativity. Sorry? Creativity. Creativity is about will, yeah. Enthusiasm, yeah. Enthusiastic. Openness, a, cho a choice to have your soul open, yeah. So you could even say choice is about how you use your will, couldn't you? Uh, can you see there's quite a lot involved with will? That's why it's such an important thing to learn about how we use our will. Because there's a lot of things there that are very positive. Or, or, by the way, the interesting thing about will is that it can be used completely negative or completely positive or anything in between. That's the interesting thing about will. If we understand the relationship between will and pain, it would help us a lot. Do you know what I mean by that? If we exercise our will out of harmony with love and truth we automatically cause pain for ourselves and others. Whether we are sensitive to that pain or not, we automatically create it. And if we use our will in harmony with love and truth, we automatically create pleasure for ourselves and other people, whether we are sensitive to it or not. Right? And our own emotional sensitivity depends on our humility. In other words, you'll feel it if you're humble. But if you choose to not be humble, you won't feel it. So if you choose to act out of harmony with love and truth, and also you choose to not be humble, you won't feel the results of acting out of harmony with love and truth. You have to choose to be humble before you'll feel the results. And that's feel positive or negative results, in fact. Any person who's trying to shut down one group of emotions, which is all about humility, will shut down entire groups of emotions. It's impossible for you to experience pain, or let's put it a different way, it's impossible for you to, to experience pleasure if you're trying to shut down your pain. You will become desensitized to all emotion if you do that. And that's how God created you, to be open and sensitive to all emotion. A child's like that, that's what we need to be like. We need to be open and sensitive to all emotion. When we're open and sensitive to all emotion, which is humility, when we use our will in harmony with love and truth, we'll feel the pleasure of it. We'll feel the pleasure of it, like internally. It'll be just like we'll be overwhelmed with the joy of it inside of ourselves. When we use our will out of harmony with love and truth and we're sensitive, we'll feel the pain of it. And the pain's telling us, wow, you did something out of harmony with love and truth. That feels pretty bad. So you know sometimes the guilty conscience feeling that we get, those kind of feelings, the painful type of emotional feelings, that's all telling us when we've used our will out of harmony with love and truth, if we're sensitive to it. Right? Now, even the average murderer is sensitive to using their will out of harmony with love and truth when it comes to their mur murdering somebody, ironically but usually they're only sensitive after the fact. Right? What we need to learn to do is become sensitive before the fact, before we act. Even considering the action, the intention. So when we use our will to even consider an action that's out of harmony with love, if we're really sensitive, in other words, if we're really humble, we won't do it because we'll feel the pain we would create if we had done it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So God made this beautiful system to help us understand these basic things, but also to help us grow in harmony with love and also experience pleasure all of our life rather than just momentary pleasure at different points in our life that, that, and then we have a lot of pain. You know? And the average person's life on earth, unfortunately, is that we have sort of times of pleasure. Usually those times aren't very long. And we have a lot of drudgery. <laughs> generally, 
and that's because we've desensitized to anything generally and then we have some pain that's the average person's life and the reason why we have that pain is because of the choices that have been made either by ourselves or others out of harmony with love and truth and that's god's feedback system so prayer the greatest is the greatest uh, po po uh, positive choice that you can make regarding the use of your will because it has the greatest effect on your soul what it allows to occur is it allows love from a being that created you to enter you that wasn't there in the first place so this whole concept that people have nowadays that you know love already exists within our soul we've just got to recognize it i don't agree with that at all i've observed in the spirit world for many years people souls who have no love in them at all and they've had to exercise their will to receive it and so once we exercise our will to pray and receive this love this love can enter us and transform us that is, so therefore it becomes the greatest thing you could do with your will right? but it's still an expression of your will so that's why i haven't included it in the list here because it's, it's an expression of one part in particular of your will. Yeah. Okay, um, if we just come across uh, John who's nearby, and then who had your hand up over here? If we go to the back there, with a, you keep your hand up so that they can hand the mic to you. Thanks. Fire away. I've been studying the iris for some 30 some years, and mm -hmm. uh, I've been especially interested in understanding the small traits of color specs and fiber separations and all. And yep. I noticed you've talked a bit on that regarding uh, what are sometimes called blemishes, which could be maybe freckles or something, coming and going depending on the condition of a person's soul. Yep. And uh, now I have a few ideas about that correspondence, but I'm wondering if you can elaborate on uh, the connection between both the color spots as well as the breaks or separations if there's a correspondence to that to something in the soul condition rather than go into the specifics of it which would take many many hours right, what probably i'd like to do is discuss with the group um, who's probably not as interested in the subject as mm -hmm. maybe you might be mm -hmm. is the generalities of it just mm -hmm. so that you have a bit of an understanding of what goes on in terms of the eye itself right remember earlier i wrote down the three selves what were those three selves? You remember, John? <coughs> yeah, they were the, uh, the, the real self, the damaged self, and the facade. Right, real self, the damaged self, or the injured self. Yeah, let's call it or, yeah, injuries. Yeah, I was thinking damaged cloud before, but injured self. Yeah, yeah, the injured self and the facade. The facade. You remember that? Yes. Now, the real self God created. The injured self, generally our environment created as we were growing up but also we created through the choices that the unloving choices that we made so every unloving choice we made we injure our soul further and the facade we created so that we could ignore the injuries mm -hmm. right, so that's the general principle now it's interesting what happens inside of the eye with regard to all of these things in the first century i said to people that the eye was the you know, anyone the window, the window of the soul yeah or the mirror of the soul so if, if you look at your iris, so here's your eye, there you go. And now, obviously, we have the, the pupil, uh, what's the middle of that eye called again? Pupil. Uh, pupil. P-U-P-I-L. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how that word yeah. is a word involved with teaching. A uh, student. Anyway. Um, and then, then you've got the coloured part of your eye, obviously. Now, the way God created your soul, so if we look at your soul, here's your soul. Yeah, so in my case, male. And I've got two bodies. I've got my spirit body and I've got my physical body. All right. So we just write that back on, physical body. How God created the eye of both the spirit body and the physical body, by the way. So the spirit body has eyes. So when you arrive in the spirit world, you will actually still have two eyes, by the way. There's no, there's no like third eye that, you know, you now become a one-eyed being or anything like that. You, you, you have two eyes still in your spirit body. Does that make sense? So, so you still have, an eye, you still have a, a pupil and, a, and an iris and you can look at the eye and see reflections of people's soul. In fact, the way God created it was 
the eye, not only the eye, by the way, you know, your whole body reflects your soul condition. So it's not just the eye that's reflecting your soul condition, but your whole body that's reflecting your soul condition at this point in time. But your eye is interesting in that the, what happens to your eye is it, it has a direct correspondency to what happens to your soul. Okay? So what, you, what start ha starts happening is the physical body here, we've got our eyes, and the spirit body, eyes, uh, reflecting the condition of the soul itself. And this is the condition, now we're referring to condition in terms of the condition in love from God's perspective, not from your own. So in other words, a lot of times we think, we think our condition is pretty good, but God looks at it and goes, yeah, it's not as good as you think, right? <laughs> So, so it's our condition in love from God's perspective, not our own. Now, let's put all this together. We've got our real self. Now, our real self is reflected in the eye. Our injured self is also reflected in the eye. And our facade is also reflected in the eye. Which is interesting, if you know what you're looking at. Right? But many iridologists, and Denny has been one of them, and obviously John and another, you you've have, have, not, have through years of experience seen that there's certain markings in a certain eye, you know, two, three, four, five o'clock, whatever, certain types of markings around the eye, uh, the iris. We're now we're talking about, and uh, are all related to something. And it seems that every person with a certain type of injury has that thing. Every person with a physical problem of a certain kind has that thing in that location. So this is the beauty of iridology is that you can look at the eye and go, wow, this person's got cancer actually and they don't even know it because there is a certain type of marking in the eye that would indicate such a thing. Does that make sense? Uh, how many are you all aware of this? Or this is iridology, so you're all aware. I don't want to give you a lesson in iridology. I'm just trying to basically show how all of these things affect it in your eye. Every time you act out of harmony with love from God's perspective, you are either creating new injuries to yourself and acting probably in your facade. As a result, there will be things that happen to your eye. Now, for the majority of people, the problems that we have in our eye come from the injuries that we incur, usually during the time from the time we are conceived to the time that we have some kind of self-determination. Now, for the majority of people, that's the time from the time they're conceived to seven years or eight years of age, around that time. For some, it might go as long as 12 or 13 years of age. It just depends on how suppressed they've been by their mum and dad and what kind of a life that mum and dad have forced them into living. And for some, it might even be 18 or 19 years of age by the time they start having some kind of or some form of self-determination. So the form of self-determination we have has a large bearing, or what has a large bearing on it, is our history with regard to how much we have been suppressed in our soul or how many injuries we have incurred over the type period of our life. Every injury places uh, what I would classify as marks on our eye. Right? Now, you guys have technical terms for different types of marks, don't you? So, um, and maybe at some point in time, um, you can give a seminar about all of those technical terms and how they relate. But what I would like to show you is that the real self is like a layer. So if we, if we took this eye and we upended it and done a cross-section of it, you would have the first layer of the eye, and we're now we're talking about the iris, the first layer of the iris, it's almost run out now, so we just grab a light blue for some reason, it seems to work, is, you could say, the real self. The second layer that goes onto the eye is the injured self. And the third layer that goes on the eye, which most iridologists 
can see two or for those it's rare to see three but would be the facade that the person has placed on themselves does that make sense now from an emotional perspective when you're sensitive emotionally you can feel all of those things so the more sensitive you become emotionally once you're at one with god for example you will be sensitive to those three layers of people when you meet a person you'll feel the real person you know the thing the qualities that god created in that individual you will also feel what damage was done in fact you won't only feel it you will actually be able to say to them oh when you were one years of age this happened oh i didn't know that yeah no it happened to you and this is what caused this particular event you'll be able to all of this information comes to you through soul to soul transmission but most people on earth are not sensitive to soul from soul to soul and so this the iridology gives you a way of becoming sensitive to what's really going on without yet developing sensitivity at the soul level so it's another another feedback system that god's giving you to have a look at yourself and it's interesting that it's your eye because you've actually got to look quite you know carefully before you see these things in the eye right and and in fact the way it's been placed in your eye you've got to look very carefully sometimes to see the things as most iridologists would know sometimes they'll take a photograph of your eye and blow it up so that they can see the eye properly right? and i think you then you do some seminars about that don't you like taking photos of people's eye blowing it up and having it on a big screen and pointing out different things yep. now a lot of the times we only want to know what's good about ourselves isn't that the case so in other words we really only want to know what is really you know the real part of ourselves that we would hope to believe is real and when it comes to our injuries there is a temptation to want to um, spin the injury do you know what i mean by spin it like you know like an advertising person would do you know so so the real injury might be you're a user of men <laughs> you know if you're a woman and you just want to use men and you say and and then this person who spins it might say what well, you have a female dominance that's really quite beautiful <laughs> that's the spin right? right and this is our problem is that when we're iridologists we've got to be careful uh, and because a lot of the times what you're trying to do is put a positive spin on something that's quite a negative trait or a negative injury that needs to be addressed so so once you feel these things as well as see them in the eye now we've got a powerful interaction because you can feel from the person their soul what's going on in their soul and you can feel oh yes no this is a quality that god created inside of the soul and when you look at the eye you can see from that third layer which is a very hard layer to see because most people have the injuries and the facade just totally covering that last layer and so it is a very difficult layer to see the real individual and so often you're reliant on the spirits with you telling you what's really there rather than your own sensations or feelings but you can see the real person like their personality what they really love and what they desire and the kind of individual nature they have and things like that you can see it and then not only that you'll be able to see the injuries what what different things have happened to them during their life and when they happened and what's going on and how the effect is in their body because different parts of the body are actually reflected in the eye as well so in other words if a person has a power problem with their bowel you can see it in their eye and if a person has a problem in their you know heart or their lungs you see it in their eye and, and in fact it, there's every single organ represented in the eye and of course every single organ is affected emotionally by some emotion that you might be holding on to at different times so that's also the 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 state of health of that organ is reflected in the eye all right so these are all reflected in the eye now you can see for a start that if you were sensitive emotionally to a person's full condition you would not need to look into their eye all right you could just sit down and feel them and feel everything and in fact when you become a celestial spirit in terms of your condition of love and that can happen while you're on earth or in the spirit world it just depends on how much love you receive you have the ability to understand their real nature of a person 
And they could be in the hells in their condition. They could be in a terribly unloving condition, for example, and you could still feel, no, there's this good quality that's in them that I can feel. Because you can feel the real self that God created. Does that make sense? But at the same time, you can also feel the injuries that their parents created or their environment created. And you can even feel the time in which it happened and the experience they had and all those kind of issues. And you can also see and feel the choices they made to cover over their injuries and what effect that had. Now, the fact that God placed all of that in the eye is another loving expression to ourselves that if we really want to see ourselves truthfully, we have lots of ways of seeing it. We have the eye. We have our body reflecting our condition at any single moment. And what uh, iridologists have generally found is there, uh, years ago there might have been theories that come up that you can change the eye, but what they've generally found is that no eye changes in a positive direction. Now you can see why, can't you? Because as we go on in life, we generally do more things that are in harmony with our past beliefs and behaviours and are more things that are in harmony with our lack of love and lack of truth and we just act in the same way, act in the same way and once we get to 12, 13, 14, 15 and up to you know, our late teens, our injuries are fairly set and so what we choose to do with our life is going to be pretty set actually after that point. And it's very predictable, actually. For many people, once you're a celestial spirit, you can predict tens of years into their future and be pretty accurate just based on what you feel from them right at the moment and what their intentions are. Does that make sense? But God's placed this feedback system into your eye to allow you another form of seeing, another form of seeing what's going on. Whether you choose to use it or not is up to you. Just like if you choose to look at your body and examine it and see what's happening over time. Or you choose to examine your personality and see what's happening over time. So too you can look in your eye and see what's happening over time. And what they've generally found, and correct me if I'm wrong here you guys, but I think what the iridologists have generally found is that the iris is relatively clear up until the age of two years of age or just a bit under. It's relatively clear of blemishes and spots, but it's not yet fully formed with its real self either, and which is normal, of course, because what's happening is that we are growing and we are learning to become ourselves during that phase of our life. But then what happens, and, and it is rare, although not unheard of, to find a blemish in the eye under two, but it usually is related to spirit attachments and other kinds of events. Then what happens is from the age of two onwards, now different, by this stage we're starting to act out. You know, that's why sometimes we call them the terrible twos, right? We're starting to act out some of the injuries that are imposed upon us from our environment. And as a result, the injuries start to build. And as that starts to build, the blemishes start to appear in the iris. Both left and right is different too, by the way. Both of them have different reflections and therefore they are completely different. And then, usually, by the time of eight or nine years of age, that process has all of the blemishes in the eye that you'll still have when you're 50 or 60 or 70. Right? And some have changed beyond, that, beyond you know, 10, 12, 15. But, but usually by the time a person gets to 20, you very rarely see, if any, change whatsoever in a positive direction. No, usually no change in a positive direction and occasional changes in a negative direction depending on certain events. And that's what they've found through analysing tens of thousands of eyes right, with people. Now, we can see why this is the case. Because the average person on this planet does not change in a positive direction with regard to love once their beliefs about love have been set inside of themselves. And our beliefs about love have been set mostly because of our environment. In other words, we believe generally what our environment believes about love. And that's why it becomes set. And at this stage, they haven't found, I don't think from any of your analyses you've found any person at this point, have you, that's had a positive change? It's very unusual. The only change we've seen is either this enlargement of a spot 
or even the appearance of one that of a new used spot. to be there, but it's very, very unusual. I can't think of any examples where they went away or disappeared. Yes. Now, I have had photos taken of my iris and I've, uh, years ago, and my iris was in a terrible mess. Now, unfortunately, um, I don't, I haven't, the guy who took all of those photos has now died, so of course all of my photos died with it. But, um, and my eye has changed immensely over the time that I've been working through emotions, but, but only the last sev 17 years. That's when it changed. I don't know of anyone else who says they're on the divine love path that have changed their eye at this point in a positive direction. We'll keep track of that. Huh? And, but it would, uh, and the reason why is I feel not many people at this point have actually engaged the path in a true soul-based fashion that I'm trying to describe. The problem that I have when I'm describing something is I'm using intellectual words to describe emotions and feelings that obviously will be interpreted a certain way by an audience, uh, which will be very different to the way I feel them. And this is a problem with the transmission of information. When you have soul-to-soul -soul transmission of information, there is no danger of any misinterpretation. But when you have information that goes from the soul into the intellect and then into words and then into language and then gets transmitted by voice to somebody else, there are a huge number of interferences in the process of receiving information. Right? And this is the problem that we face. But if you at this point understand that we've got the real self, the injured self and the facade self in the eye. Now, as the facade is torn away by the individual's will to engage humility, with humility all of their emotions, there will be changes to the I. For the most people, this never happens. Because the most people establish their facade, usually by the time they've entered their teenage years, and for that reason, after that point, they live in their facade for the rest of their life. And if you could get under the facade and into the injury, you'll find the different blemishes will disappear in the iris. But that rarely happens. Because most people never get out of their facade long enough to feel the actual injury that has driven their facade. And as a result, you see, if your person did that, they would have these things disappear in their eye. And in the end, you'd be left with the true, real nature of the individual reflected in the eye. There will be no blemishes, spots, and other indications of injuries after that point. So now when I look into my eye, and my eye is very different to what it was when I saw it like 17 or 18 years ago when I had some photos taken. But it's taken 17 years of self-reflection every single day and dealing with emotion every single day to get to a place where some of the things have disappeared. Interestingly enough, if someone looks in my eye now, you'll be able to see four primary areas that I still have injury. And I'm completely aware of what they are, but the beauty of it is even in my body, where I have physical problems, are still reflected in the eye, so they're telling me they're still there. Those particular things are still there. Does that make sense? Um, I don't need to look in my eye to do it because I'm pretty sensitive now to my own injuries, right? Because I've chosen to be sensitive emotionally to my own injuries. But if someone like Denny looks into them, I think you did last year, I can't remember what you saw in my eye at the time, I, you might be out of but <laughs> not going to tell anyone. <laughs> um, didn't you call me a pussycat? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what you call me. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that means that I don't, um, that I'm not a tiger. Um, that I means that I'm sort of easy to get along with or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, there, there are certain personality traits, of course, that you'll also see shown or, or demonstrate in the eye. Now, I feel for iridology to move forward, there needs to be an understanding, particularly in its practitioners, that there is this direct relationship between the real injured and facade selves that affects the soul connection with the eye and there is a way to see all of these things as emotional injuries rather than just physical problems. 
So many iridologists accept that, and, and in fact the whole iridology um, community generally accepts, that the physical problems are demonstrated of the body are demonstrated in the eye and that's quite demonstrable but the issue I feel is demonstrating a relationship between the emotional injury and the physical problem and that's where I feel there needs to be much growth in the in the um, practice of iridology where we need to see the relationship between the actual emotions that drive the injuries in the facade and how that affects the physical body in certain locations and I feel once that shift has been made, iridology will become a very, it can become a very powerful tool to help people see what the problem is or what the problems are within themselves. Firstly, physically, but more importantly, from a soul condition or emotional perspective. Is, would it be fair to say that the facade is built on a foundation of denials? And yes, the facade is built on a foundation of two things, the denial of the injuries and the desire to have a perspective of the real self that is not true. So it's, there's two sets of basically emotional things that create the facade. Um, the injury, of course, it's easy to see, you know, how we des desire to not feel the injury. That's pretty obvious. And, and we create facade to not feel the injury. But there is also this other aspect about the facade, and that is how much we want to be someone that we're not. And a, a lot of times that is driven by our parents' desire for us to be someone that we're not. So in other words, when we were growing up as children, we often had imposed upon us things that were completely beyond our desires or even our physical capabilities. So, you know, this is where, like, a father who loves American football wants his son to grow up be a quarterback. Right? And the son neither has the physical desire, you know, the physical body nor the desire to be a quarterback and and his father instead of uh, uh, you know recognizing that as a part of his real nature he goes no I'm going to enforce you you know so he goes he sends him off to camp this and camp that and do this and do that gets him to build up his body and eventually he gets to be the quarterback but he doesn't even really want to be there right and uh, and this is the this is the way in which we finish up developing facades for others we want so it's not only just for ourselves, generally, that we develop our facade. It's like that hard eggshell layer to prevent further injury, I suppose. Exactly. It's a, it's a desire to be what w has been imposed upon us in order to avoid specific emotions and fears, and particularly in order to avoid violence. For many of us, it's the avoidance of physical or emotional violence that creates a lot of our facade. Once we, um, once we recognise these things from a practice perspective, from a, from a doctoring perspective, we would see the reflection in the eye and be able to help the person uh, find that emotion. And as I've pointed out to Denny a few times, it's not the good things about the person that prevents them from being at one with God. Do you understand? It's not the good things about you that prevent you to being at one with God. God created all those good things. They're already at one with God, <laughs> right? It's the things that others created or you created that are out of harmony with love that prevent you being at one with God. So when people have conversations with me, they get quite confronted sometimes because they want me to say a lot of good things about them. And I, I go, well, like, yes, I see all those good things in you, but, and it's even good that you're asking me the question, but at the end of the day, it's not the good thing that's stopping you. And I feel you need to focus on the things that you know, aren't so good inside of us that are out of harmony with love that will eventually expose our condition. Like finding emotional injuries that might be so covered up that they don't even know they're there, right? Exactly, like exactly. And even de deconstructing the facade. I feel that that is a huge problem in most societies is the deconstruction of the facade because the facade usually has been created in order for the person to maintain their own opinion about themselves or for them to maintain other people's agreement of their condition. Now, in both cases, if you think about it, that there's a quite strong uh, fear-based motivations to keep your facade. Like, for example, the average person here in the States wouldn't walk around naked, right? You'd get arrested, wouldn't you? Yeah. 
and I, I think most of the time that's probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> you would get arrested. So what would stop you from walking around naked? The thought of getting arrested. There's also another thing that might stop you, and what's that? Shame might stop you. Cold. <laughs> Anything else? Not wanting to disturb others is even a good... That's a great consideration. That's a more loving one, right? So, so you can see there are some considerations that we'd be loving that would cause us to not walk around naked. There'd be other considerations that are really fear-based that would cause us to not walk around naked. Can you see that? Now, as a result of that, the ones that are fear-based are going to have a very strong motivation to do them, aren't they? They're going to, you're going to be motivated to do what the fear dictates generally. So for the majority of us, we walk around with clothes on, even though it's 40, well, what would it be for you? 110 degrees Fahrenheit. We'd walk around with clothes on because of these social norms that have been established, but also for other considerations. And some of them are loving and some of them are not. All right? And that's the case with all of our injuries, pretty much. Our facade has been created not just for our own perception of ourselves, but it's also for others' perception of us. And we have deep fears related to other people's perception of us. And a lot of inertia, I imagine, here is what you're saying, is people don't want to change if they're in a comfort zone. Exactly. But then they're ignoring all of the emotional injury because they've covered it over. Exactly. So the task is to release the held emotions and denials and judgments and move the feelings out, right? And exactly. To the surface. If we take an analogy, let's say we went out on the freeway outside here. The, what is it called? You're in eight. It's eight, is it? Yeah. Highway eight. And uh, there's a four-lane highway basically there in, both, in each direction. And you decided to drive on the north going, or the, what is it, the east going lane, driving west. Obviously, there would be a lot of people opposing <laughs> your decision. Does that make sense? And this is the trouble with our facade or giving it up. A lot of times, it's not so much our own inertia to see our facade that is our problem. It is the fact that everyone else around us wants to see that facade too. Right? And so when you decide to start deconstructing that facade, it's like getting on the eastbound lane driving west and, and everybody is opposing you. And they not only oppose you emotionally, they oppose you, like they'll physically oppose you many times, right? They'll try to restrict your behavior in some way through threats, through violence, through bribery, all sorts of things will come out of the closet in order to stop you from traveling down the opposite direction that the average person wants to go down. The average person wants to see your facade, unfortunately, right? In a soul based thing, none of us want to be in a facade. And everyone wants to be someone who's real. But the reality is we're living in societies that want to see our facade all the time. And in fact, our very parents that we lived with from the beginning probably wanted to see our facade. And this is why it's very difficult to deconstruct it. Because it's not only your own inertia or your own resistance. But in fact, most of your own resistance has nothing to do with what you wanted it's got everything to do with what other people wanted that you now feel you must support. Yeah, I've always noticed there's an awful lot of behavior that is controlled by expectation, especially yes. expectation of others, of you, on you. And a lot of people respond to that. I mean, it happens all the time, it seems, the expectation. And a lot of times the expectation isn't just like, kindly expectation. Demand. It's literally demand, isn't yeah, it? It's like, yeah. oh, I want you to be this way and if you're not going to be this way, I don't want anything to do with you. And most of us are so afraid of nobody wanting anything to do with us that we'll conform to what people expect, what people expect of us. And that's a risk of being too obedient, I guess, to conventionality, huh? It, it is, and, and we've been taught to be, of course. You know, our very existence uh, on Earth generally 
has been confined by all of these expectations that begin in our childhood with our parents. And then eventually, uh, because parents have it in a family, families make up society, of course the same expectations exist in society, and therefore they exist in our political systems and our religious systems and our economic systems and so forth. So even our health systems are all partly to do with expectations of what we expect. So, so these expectations are really demands that are demands that you maintain your facade, that you maintain this image of yourself that's not only for you, but it's also for everyone around you, uh, in order to keep them, in order to keep them happy with you. Yep. And so this is why you very rarely will see change in the iris, with, even with regard to facade, let alone the injuries. Because most people have so much uh, pressure externally to never give up their facade that they never even get to their injuries to process them emotionally. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Yeah. I feel if, we, if with all forms of doctoring, if I could put them all together, you know, all the health system, we need to understand the relationship between the emotion in the soul and the creation of physical ailments and so forth. Now, there is a growing awareness of that. I would say it's a very slowly growing awareness. There's a lot of inertia in the, and resistance from both the medical profession and people in general to not understand that. The reason for the, mo the inertia, or what I feel is the resistance, is a lot of times we don't want to take personal responsibility for what we've created in our own body. We don't. And you think about it, the average person doesn't want to take personal... So when you get a headache, that's your own emotional condition, your soul, creating a response in your body, in your brain, and it's occurring physiolo physiologically in your brain as a result of your suppression. Generally, it will be your suppression of... Uh, sadness that you that the headaches being created for, but there are other reasons why we might why headaches might be created. But anyway, this suppression of sadness generally creates the headache. What do you do? No, the, the average person takes a pill. I've got a headache. It's terrible. I need to go and you know. And we notice some of your adverts here about we're quite su surprised with your adverts here about some of the uh, pills that you take because it seems like they're actually advertising against the pill rather than for it. But anyway, <laughs> um, it's like all these cautions and I understand that effects. must be to do with legal claims and so forth. But uh, yeah, it seems quite... If, if, if the average person in Australia looked at that and said, is that an advert that's positive or is that an advert that's <laughs> negative? But, uh, but we even, with all of those warnings, still buy the pill. And that's an indication. Why do we do that? We do that because we want to avoid what our soul created. We want to maintain the facade. We don't even want to go to the injury that created that particular feeling within us that we're now trying to suppress. And it's the suppression of these emotions that causes each physical problem and, and then, of course, causes a reflection in the eye. And if, if, we could, if, if we could put all the medical professions together and say, look, what we need to understand is the suppression of, the, of emotions in different areas of our... have effect in different areas of our body that cause... is a major cause, in fact, of illness. In fact, the primary cause, aside from accidents, and even accidents are caused by the soul, but the primary cause of all the other physical problems are the individual person's suppression of their own emotional condition. And if we saw the relationship between that, I doubt whether we would start searching for suppressives, which, which basically what the pills all are, they're just trying to suppress something that God is trying to show us. Yeah, it creates even more resistance, the suppression does. Correct, correct. In other words, we're wanting to go back to the facade every time. We don't even want to see the injury. We don't even want to get there. And this is something that we've got to collectively change. If we want the world systems to change, our demands upon the system have to change. So, like, what's created in this world is supply and demand in almost every case. So whatever your government is doing right now is about supply and demand. It's supplying what the average 
emotional condition of the person in the USA is demanding. That's what it's supplying. And, if, and I know many of you might not think that, but it's true. It's supplying what the emotion demands. Not the intellect demands, the emotion demands. And we, we had a talk about this the other night, how many of us are in so much fear that we don't realise what our fear creates. We're in denial of the fear. And then when the government goes off and has a war with somebody, we think, I didn't create it. I didn't vote for them. I didn't create it. Yes, you did. Your soul is in a state of fear that causes this demand going out to your government. And the, the government's just responding to your soul-based demands. That's how everything works, actually, in this world. And in fact, in the entire universe, it's such a wonderful thing because we get reflected back to us what we're really demanding. Does that make sense? Now, this is what we need to see. The eye will help you see that, but honestly, if you don't, if you don't want to be sensitive to it emotionally, then it's highly unlikely you'll look at the eye and want to be <laughs> see it either. You know, most of the time, you'll deny it's there too. But these are tools that we can use that God's given us. Your body is the tool God's given you to reflect. Your eye is another tool that God's given you to reflect physically. But obviously, if you're more sensitive emotionally, you'll probably be reflecting already and you'll already know. But it would be great if we had this beautiful health system that actually saw the relationship between cause and effect, actually addressed the causes rather than making pills to address the effect. But the unfortunate thing about our health system, and particularly the health system in the States here, because your, your health system drives many of the health systems in the world through medication, it's all about suppressing the effect. Well, the pharmaceutical cartels are controlling the medical industry, of course, along with the insurance companies, and they're all in bed with each other, I guess. But I, but I even feel like a lot of the New Age practices are all about suppressing the effect. If you look at the average... You know, person who goes to get an alignment of their spiritual body. What's it all about? They have some kind of pain or suffering that they're going through. They don't want to address it from an emotional perspective. So they go instead to a practitioner who's going to realign their body. They feel good for a couple of days. Next two weeks, they're bad again. You know, it's the same when we go to chiropractic or something else. They have to adjust us. Like, like someone like, go to someone like Lawrence, get a, you know, adjustment done. Two weeks later, they're back again. Because their soul hasn't changed anything. And we get this repetitive nature of healthcare where we're just fixing up, fixing up the effects, constantly fixing up the effects of what people are unwilling to address as the cause. And many people don't want to address it as a cause. In fact, you know, some people have emailed me and said, oh, I've got cancer, this, and what can I do? And I say, well, do you firstly realise that your cancer is... And they tell me, you know, where it began, usually. And I said, well, do you realise your cancer is laid at this particular emotion about these particular people and that particular demand you have? And you should see how much rage I get as a result. Like, how dare you tell me? You know? And I write back sometimes, well, do you want to fix it or do you want to just have be told something that somebody else will tell you or do you want to actually fix the problem? And as yet, I have not seen a person cure their cancer from actually dealing with an emotion. It's very interesting, isn't it? In fact, what I have found is this. If a person has a physical problem, the problem is usually of such long standing and in, they are in so much denial already that it's very unlikely they will address the emotional issue that created the problem. And that's a bit sad, but... Well, the whole suppression is another form of denial, and it seems that the whole healthcare industry is based largely on suppression, which is just covering denial with more denial, it seems. So exactly. what seems to be a good idea maybe for the future is for people to do emotional release as a way of getting at uncovering those and letting them go instead of covering them up. Mm -hmm. But as we've also discussed, there are addictions involved with needing another person involved in your emotional release mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the fear of being crazy going it alone you know we often as we discussed a few days ago with a group there's often whole groups of emotions that cause us to want other people to share our emotion to want other people to save us from our emotion want other people to deny that we have the emotion so that we can deny it and so forth and so forth, right? Now, every one of these emotions creates a different result when it comes to dealing with our emotional injuries. 
if I have an emotion that I want to share my injury with you, so in other words, I want you to create the space so that I can feel my feeling properly. And I want you to sit there with me and help me through it. And if you don't do that, you're not a very nice person. I don't like you. right? Let's say I have that kind of attitude. I have huge addictions. Now, those addictions are going to be covering over fears that I'm totally unwilling to address. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So one, one of the things we need to have a, from a very young age in our educational system is this relationship between our own emotions and our own creations and our personal responsibility for what we create. And if that happened when we were little children, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight years of age, by the time we're 10, we'd be going, I can solve anything. I've got a physical problem, I know how to solve it. I don't have to go to a doctor to solve it. All I've got to do is work out what the emotion is and work through my emotion. And I'd have complete confidence that I can work it through my own emotion because I would have done it so many times before through my own example. I'd be 10 years old, completely free of any disease. That complete, be, yeah. Right? That's what I would be. But for that to happen, the adults who, de who <laughs> determine what happens in the educational institutions have to change. And of course, this is why it's slow. The reason why change is slow is because the adults enforce their belief on the new generation rather than seeing that their belief is incorrect and changing their belief within one generation. The reality is if we all changed our belief in one generation, the very next generation of people would have no resistance to feeling their emotions. So they'd have very, a lot of humility, no resistance to understanding the truth because they'd see truth as a very important thing that have no resistance to exercising their will in harmony with their own desires. What's the time? 5.30, no worries. And, and that have no resistance to many other things. It would happen automatically. Wouldn't that be beautiful? It would be beautiful, but the average adult nowadays on the planet doesn't believe, has no faith that it's possible. In fact, they have more faith in the medical perfection and fixing the effect then they do have faith in the fact that the cause is being caused by something else other than what the effects uh, are. You know, that there is a relation they don't even have faith that there's a relationship. Anything <laughs> other than the status quo would threaten the facade of the doctor industry and the academic industry and everything else, which is all facade, it seems it, largely facade. Exactly. So we collectively have facades and injuries, just like we individually have facades and injuries. And this is why, and perhaps this is what we can finish off with tonight. We've got another four hours if you want to come tomorrow to ask questions. And what we can finish off with tonight is this thought. If I change myself, then the world has a hope of changing. But if I refuse to change myself, the world has very little hope in changing. Because almost the world is almost always made up with a lot of other people like myself who avoid the truth about themselves. So the power of your own individual change cannot be underestimated. Now many of us start off believing it's not possible. But eventually, once you start seeing the result of change, and this is something that I experienced in the first century a lot that I'd like to probably share with you in closing. When I was quite young in the first century, I was in my, uh, just before my teenage years, we were, we were living in Egypt. In the, um, the, the area was the area that's now known as Alexandrina, you know, in that area of Egypt, in the Delta. And uh, there was a large community there of what you would call Jewish fundamentalists, I suppose, which, of which my father was one. And they, there was co close to a million of them, in fact, living in this, in this area, a fairly large area. And they had all sorts of businesses and so forth. And as I observed the things going on in the relationship around of everything that was going on around me, I realised there was this direct relationship between cause and effect, you know, this relationship of what happened, and there was always a cause that I could see that was generally emotionally, emotional cause that I could see that turned into some kind of physical action. And I saw that unless I changed and demonstrated through my own personal actions that change was possible, no one around me would even believe change was possible. Now, at that time, I didn't know how to change. Like, I didn't understand God's love well. I had a very loose understanding of God's love. 
And it wasn't until much later, after I read through the prophets, and I, particularly by the time I was 12, we were still living in, Greece, in uh, Egypt. By the time I was 12, what happened was that um, I'd done more studies with the lo- in the local, I suppose you'd call it tabernacle, um, and, uh, and read a lot of more of the prophets. And in particular, one of the prophets uh, struck me quite markedly, and this was the prophecies uh, related to the book of Hosea, um, which are all about love, actually. And a man who had a wife who cheated on him, and... Um, and he accepted her back. And then she cheated on him again and he accepted her back. And then she cheated on him again and he accepted her back. And I started realising that this was all about forgiveness, right? And learning how to forgive. And, and I had lots of things happening towards me that, uh, during that time that I had to forgive. So I went, started working through the process of forgiveness. As I felt the prophet Hosea was telling me that I needed to do. As a result of that, I could feel my own change. And what I noticed after changing was that things started changing around me. I didn't control them. I didn't tell anybody. They just automatically started changing. And initially I thought this was just like an aberration, you know, some strange phenomenon that I had no control over at all. And, uh, but as I grew, and particularly as I entered the later teenage years when I was 16, 17, I realised that this happened all the time. That every change that I made, soul change that I made, the world around me changed and people's response to me changed and how people acted towards me changed and how they acted with other people while they were with me changed even. And I didn't even have to tell them anything. It just happened. And I started seeing that all it required for things to change around me was for me to change. That's all it required. And once I started understanding the flow of God's love, as I've described to you, you know, the flow of God's love in the soul and how love would transform, and once I started engaging that process, the change occurred even more rapidly. And I found now that people were confronted that would not normally be confronted just by my own presence. Like I could just sit there and they'd be angry. They didn't even know why they were angry, but I could feel why they were. There was a soul-based interaction going on where something had healed in my soul that they wanted me to have as an addiction still, that they wanted me to have as an injury still. And something had healed inside of me that, that their addiction no longer met. And they got angry because their addiction was no longer getting met. Just me sitting there caused that. And I started realising that you barely had to really say anything. You just had to change yourself. But then I realised that if I knew these things, I had to share it with others. I had to help them understand how to change themselves. That's what I needed to do. And remember I said that, that, that you don't change through any effort of your own, actually. What I found happening was that as I received God's love, I changed. I released something. As a result of receiving God's love, I'd cry and release something. And then as I, as I released something change occurred automatically around me and I realized that all I had to do is share with other people how to change all right now it wasn't many years after that but so in my 20s and it wasn't many years after that that I died I was 33 or 34 years of age actually 30 what you call 33 and a half nowadays I died and uh, and I died because of people's resistance to change that's how resistive people are to change they're so resistive to change they don't want to change anything but my change created a worldwide faith that is now while highly distorted is now practiced by nearly 2.2 billion people one person's change that's how much power your soul has one person's change you imagine if the whole room of us changed what that would do. If one person's change can create 2,000 years later 2.2 billion people listening to that kind of faith, although modified, then surely 100 people's change, what would that do? It would be an incredible effect on the world. But it has to be sincere change. It can't be fake. It can't be facade. It, can't, it has to be real. God created it, so it has to be real. Right. And to me, that's the beauty of what God has done too. Real change has to occur 
before real change on the earth has to occur. Real change has to occur individually for me before real change can occur around me. Right? But sometimes people ask myself and Mary, why is it that divine truth is not growing very rapidly? You know, you know there's the first, for the first five years that I taught it, hardly anybody listened. You know? And then the next five years I taught it, we eventually got to 900 people around the world listening. So that's 10 years now, 900 people. Now in the next year, an additional 600 people listened. Right? Now why is the change seemingly so slow? The answer is quite simple. Unless Mary and I change, everything around us can't change. Right? And this is why Mary and I are very conscious of the fact that we need to do our own personal work. And what we notice quite frequently when we're, when we're travelling, people say, oh, do you want to go and see this? And you want to go and see that? And we say, no. <laughs> we're going to spend our whole day in our motel room. And they go, hmm? you're in San Diego, for goodness sake. Like, the most warmest place in, or it's not quite that, but you know, one of the most pleasant places in the US. And uh, when we go, no, our soul changing is more important than that. And over 2,000 years, we've seen San Diego grow from nothing to, you know, where it is today, of course, in addition. So there's not a high motivation to see everything around it. We've already seen. But the reality is that we understand the importance of changing ourselves in order for the reception of divine truth on the planet to grow. Of course, the same applies to yourselves. The change that you want to occur here in, your, in the USA can only occur when you truly engage this change from a soul-based perspective in sincerity and purity. That's when it will change. That's when more and more people will be interested. And eventually there will be so many people interested that, that, that people will start wondering whether it's a new religion. And it's not a new religion. It's the way to God. It's not a new religion, it's just the way. It's the way God created it to be. And, after, and all of the people who understand the way will eventually understand that too. And then everybody who connects with them will understand, hey, this is not a way to practice a religious faith. It's the way to live the rest of your life. That's how they'll understand it. But we are aware that without our change, Many of these things cannot occur. So we are not surprised when there is no change over a period of time. Because when we look at our own lives and we say, ah, we haven't changed much over the last two months, of course there can be no change externally if there was no change within myself and Mary over that period of time. Does that make sense? And the same applies to your life. Unless there is some change internally, there will be no change externally associated with your life and perhaps that's something to contemplate overnight thanks, thanks.